thank you for coming to the second seminar of the academic year. Today we have our very own Gonzalo. Uh, he did his bachelor's and master's here, then his PhD in Rome, and he's back here as a postdoc. So, all yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to seminar. So, I'll talk about my work, title uh, that's going about binaries and why we should care about them. And so, the, the, the main goal of this talk will be basically to convince you that final effects in compact, uh, compact objects are uh, a very interesting topic. Uh, and failing to convince you of that, I will at least try to convince you that they will be very relevant in the next uh, 10 years, especially for the field of uh, gravitational wave astronomy. Um, and starting, so I will be doing a brief introduction just to set the stage of uh, what title effects are. Then I'll go on to talk about the more nitty gritty details of how we can see from these high level numbers uh, that describe how a model is formed. I'll move on to talk about my work specifically, which is about the interaction between tidal effects and the spin of the contact object. And then, hopefully, uh, a brief overview of dynamical uh, tidal effects and basically what I am working on right now, what the state of the art of, of, of tidal uh, perturbation theory uh, nowadays. So on the basics, uh, we're talking about tidal deformation. We're talking about uh, an extended body being affected by something, let's say another body far away, in such a way that because of the gradient of the of the force in the Newtonian picture uh, that is being exerted, uh, with respect to the center of mass, it's like the body is being uh, stretched in the either direction. And this will, of course, lead to a deformation of the body. Uh, and there are two questions here that must be addressed. One is how does the body itself react? How the how does the body deform? Uh, which is a straight uh, question, um, and this is tried by what we see as the title of number, what what we call one of the title of numbers. And the other one, which is more interesting, one is how is the body's rotation potential affected? So because there is a deformation of the body, there will also be a deformation of the potential that that is that. That, the, that applies to the outside world. And this will matter to us because, well, this is exactly this kind of situation that uh, happens in complex object binaries. So I'll skip the details. Uh, we, we all know that the uh, complex object merger will, have, will be composed by three phases, the spiral phase, the merger itself, and then, well, the ring down or the final phase, which, which depends on what the complex object, what the complex objects are exactly. What we care about is the spiral here. Uh, in, the, in the early beginning of the of the merger, the, um, the in spiral phase can be described by nearly two point point particles. But as the two objects approach each other, they must be described as extended objects, and so tidal effects come into play. And so, what we what we what we can how we can use the tidal the, the tidal effect here is to describe. It. How does the body, how does this body's potential change due to the tidal uh, effects of this body over it? And depending on this potential, how, how its potential changes, this, will, this body will attract this other body in a different manner. And this will change the orbit of the, of the binary system. And this will change the gravitational wave signal that, is, that will detect coming from the system. An example here is of the waveform. The longest one that's in green is is for a zero tidal form field, which is the case of a black hole, as we see later on. And as we increase the tidal form field, you see that the phase of the gravitational waveform uh, is changed, and that the orbit becomes shorter. So the bodies are, because of the way the bodies are formed, they attract each other more, and the orbit becomes slightly shorter. And this is already noticeable with the uh, with current gravitational detection. Uh, and we can, in fact, when talking about the neutral star binaries, we can already const uh, constrain the, their tidal form building. And this is exactly why we should care about this, because in the end, to, if we have a, two complex objects and we can, uh, that are merging, we can um, detect the gravitational signal that they are emitting. And we can extract the tidal form building of, their, of these objects from the, from the gravitational wave signal. Tidal probability will depend on the composition of the bodies. 
And so in case, for instance, of neutron stars, this will give us an, an insight of, on how matter uh, behaves in, in the condition in which it exists inside neutron stars, which are inaccessible in any other way. So this is basically the main motivation to care about tidal, tidal probabilities, is that we'll, yeah, we will be able to access physics in, in uh, conditions that usually we, do not, uh, we are not able to access here on Earth. So moving on to the to the more detailed part of this, we'll start with Newtonian uh, gravity. So we we'll start with the spherical body, with the usual potential. Now we know we we also know that ex, ex, uh, outside there will be some something that will that is affecting this body. We have some external potential that we can write generically like this, where all the information of, of the details of the of the external potential of the of the external situation, let's say, uh, are included here in the DLM. So we we basically decompose the external potential into spherical harmonics, and now we don't have to care about what is happening outside. We just have a generic perturbation in terms of uh, multiple of certain multiple moments. And we also know that outside the body, the the the, pot the, the potential of the deformed body must follow this expression, where again we are writing it in terms of uh, of uh, multiple moments. And all the information on, on how the body is being deformed by the external uh, by the external potential is included here in the in the ILM term. Uh, what happens then is that we have our extended body first. Uh, we, we have solved this outside case in the exterior. We know that there is a broadening mode, which is the external potential. We have the decaying mode. This the, the response, and now we must solve it. We must solve the Poisson equations also here inside the body, match at the radius, and and in this way I will I will skip what exactly are written here because they are irrelevant for the situation. So I say that they are that they are um, the solution is this ETL function, and in this way we can define that the the the, res, the response of the body given by the multiple moments, the multiple moments are given by are linear on the external perturbation for this particular theory with some coefficient where the coefficient is the KL, which is a large number. This is exactly what is what is what you need to describe as the information of a body uh, to any external perturbation. Uh, again, the, 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 the deformation of the body, I mean, the how the potential is, is changes. The deformation of the body itself is given by the delta R here. Which is given by a different set of log numbers, HL, which in the end in the graphic have this simple relation with the, what we usually call the B title log numbers. And KL, as I said, depends on the KL, which is the function inside the body evaluated at the radius. And so here is the information, here is out the title of numbers that contains information about the interior of the body. So this is the, the very simple description of. How tidal numbers and tidal probabilities work in the ground. Notice that we have to do some steps here where we, we this whole uh, setup, uh, this whole work uh, depends on having a definition of what the multiple moments are. And then from there, so what the, the internal multiple moments are that are different from the external multiple moments that are, are observed in the body. And from there, extracting the world number. The point here is to translate this all into GR. Let me just ask you something quickly. Yes. These in these uh, sort of spherical coordinates are centered on the body that is deformed, on the center of mass yes. of the body that is deformed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we are yeah, we are always working from so yes, we are always working the center of mass of body that is being deformed. And in fact, this DLM will depend on the on the potential on the external potential evaluated at the center of, of the body. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yes. So, uh, what's the radius of this uh, maximum? Are uh, the, the original radius of the body? Ah, the we are not taking. Yeah, we are taking so that it's a small perturbation that we do not have to take into consideration for the for the matching. Uh, since it's a linear theory, I don't think it's necessary to enter then into more considerations of going higher order. For GR, 
ideally what we want to do. It's the same thing, but now with perturbation theory, but we still want to keep this linear so it doesn't become too complicated. And now we met so we match we met the perturbation. We have here, let's say, the outside the Schwarz uh, matrix. And we have a perturbation that ideally we can separate into a, the external, the tidal perturbation, and the response. And inside the response, there will be the, the tidal well done. This is the theory. Um, so when we apply standard topological perturbation theory, we basically obtain two master equations for each sector of uh, with each parity sector of, of our metric perturbations in this uh, power or even sector will for the wettering will has a direct analogy with the tidal wave numbering of Newtonian gravity. The axial has no direct analogy, the axial odd magnetic are all interchangeable, has no direct analogy with Newtonian gravity, and basically a new type of tidal wave number that you find uh, only in um, in ER. And by solving the these master equations, we can obtain the, the perturbations to the, the metric. We can reconstruct the metric basically. And then we see that again, we will have we can see that there is something that is similar to the to the previous behavior. We have something that is a, that has some decaying bulk uh, in the in the in the metric and something that has a, a growing bulk, which is not exactly the R R R to the L or one over R to the L plus one. There are some There are some extra terms in here as well. And this starts creating an issue because, as you can see, so first of all, the, the now we are, we are not doing, we are not dealing with just the radius of the body, we are dealing with coordinates in the yard. So this is not necessarily a unique condition. We could just make it in the coordinate, and this and this expression might change. So this starts becoming iffy, but it's still uh, we can still deal with it. And moreover, we can see that if the growing if the growing term that has this over R R to the L um, contribution and then has some other condition, if this goes on for long enough, we might arrive at the point where it becomes a term that works that goes like this. And now we cannot separate what exactly is part of the external perturbation, what exactly is part of the response. So this is, I would consider it a big problem in defining what exactly is the, the response part of the perturbation and the external part of the perturbation. And how we deal with this for in this situation is to require that this term, the growing term, has a has a finite expense, has a a finite sum of terms here that does not that does not mix with this one. And for simple cases such as this one, the static, all static type, static body case, uh, this works. And from this, we can basically obtain a method that goes like this. We say, okay, now we don't we, we say that these external equations we get rid of it, which starts being a bit artificial, but it works. And we take this. And now we can apply uh, the usual results of how to compute uh, multiple moments in GR to this, since these results require that uh, our metric is um, aesthetically flat, which now is the case, and we ignore this. And from this, we, ex we extract the multiple moments, and the multiple moments will be given by, will be linear on the, on the external, on the amplitude of the external tidal field, by definition, uh, and we have a coefficient, which is again, exactly the tidal of and so we settle this for uh, for GR. And will you get rid of the important problem? Uh, no, we basically pretend it doesn't exist by by doing this always in analogy with Newtonian gravity. So we we always say that it as long as we as in the in Newtonian we obtain the same result as in Newtonian gravity, we assume that everything is working okay. And then in the end, check that indeed we get good results with this we com when compared with the with PN approximation where we really use the title of numbers. So, what I have done in my work is to apply the, all this to rotating objects. Only to, so, using basically, we don't have for generic compact objects uh, a metric with a, with a to any spin. 
So we have to use a number of for tolerant spin using the hardware for metric for the tolerant spin. And so we always use this polarization. So we have taken the optimization. For this, all the quantities that we had before uh, of the of the of the metric for the theory. So so for the the variables of the mass theory equation. Now it's in that they are given by a term which is zero in spin, then turn that to the idea of first order in spin. And so because now with this metric we are losing uh, spherical symmetry, um, we no longer have a good separation of the even and odd uh, sectors of, of the perturbation. So what we must do is use a trick by a mathematical uh, result by, by Kojima in 1992, where we can basically by doing this separation between zero and first order quantities, we can obtain an equation for the, um, the first order quantities that has the same homogeneous part as the, as the previous one in such a case, that now has a source that is given by quantities of the opposite parity with the, with the multiple index L minus one or an L plus one. So, so basically, so basically, yeah, with the, the new Contributions to the the even sector will be sourced by the by the odd sector with this minimum or in this case where we have selection rule on what causes what. So in a sense, if we say have a, we have a direct quadrupolar uh, polar tidal field uh, that is affecting our body, with zero ordering spin, this will just induce. Uh, a response uh, response that is less than the forward. The first order in spin it might induce a res uh, response that is uh, always axial, axial uh, or magnetic to of L equal one, which is just the spin, uh, spin, or something that is of L equal three that is that is of the forward. Because again, of the this will this will enter here with the top of the spin. And if we go to the second order spin, it will, this will again start branching out and we have further contribution. Uh, because the, the structure of the equation will always be the same, that, that something of the next order will be sorted by the previous order. So, and here the angular bracket means that S is a function of A. Yes. Yeah, yeah basically, yes. This, the, this sort will be, a, will be merely a function of H0 and H0 L minus 1 and L plus 1. With the previous setup in mind, we now I now we steer the assumption that we have to do to, to make this work or that we're using this work because of well good reason. First of all, we assume time dependent perturbation. Just because the, when you start assuming time dependence, as hopefully we'll have time to see later, uh, this phenomenon here that the of the mixing between the the, the growing mode and the pain mode. Becomes a problem, and we cannot deal with it with our with this with all this setup, and we have to really change our definition of those numbers. So we will ignore this. We will not time dependent perturbation for now. By five, we require axismatic perturbation because non-axismatic perturbation will then induce time dependent perturbation. And again, we we'll want to avoid this. We assume what is called the static fluid, which is basically the fluid, the perturbation, the first order in spin perturbation of the fluid must only be non-zero for the time control. And this is, this is an assumption that that um, that is in agreement with Einstein equations, but we'll talk about the, and we'll later talk about whether it's really applicable or not. And we assume that our body is affected by a quadrant over and over electromagnetic strand of the so P two, P three, P two, and three. And again, what we what we want to obtain, what we obtain, is the sum of the following structure. We have the background that's zero order in the in the tidal perturbation and in the spin. At zero order in the spin, still we have the previous result of static tidal log numbers. And at first order in the spin, we have new uh, we have a, a new solution for perturbation, which is again we can separate using this three fold, saying that the the growing mode must be must have a finite uh, sum of terms that we can separate into external part of perturbation and the response. And the response includes a new tidal log number that. That when we compute the, the multiple moment, we see that this is a contribution that is linear on the spin, 
we on the battle field of alpha one in this case uh, of the of parity, and we on the new quantum the new type of number, which is our rotation type of number, which is independent from the from the static type of numbers, which are independent from which are apparently independent from each other. So that for each uh, new uh, external type of field that we are applying to our body, we get a new uh, a new rotation type of number that describes this deformation. However, what had been found before is that so when we when we want to apply, as we'll see later, but in brief explanation, when we want to apply uh, type of numbers really to compute the waveform, we must do so by a by the computation where we we study the interaction of we study the orbit, we study the orbit of, of two objects. Now with the interaction between the, there are several multiples, and we can write about we can basically write about Lagrangian with the the several interactions between the multiple variable coefficients and now with the numbers, which are here are in the different notation, the one that's referred to the electric and the sigma here refers to magnetic flow. When we take into consideration also the, the interactions between the spin and the multiple moment, we see that only two new terms arise in the Lagrangian, given the four different external elements that we were considering before. And so only two new coefficients enter into the Lagrangian. And in these two, these two new new coefficients must give rise to four different rotational log numbers. So necessarily, some of the rotational log numbers that we computed before must uh, have some relation between each other. And that's what exactly what we find. We, we find that, for instance, the one, the two, three, the US quadrupolar, the US quadrupolar RTLM that is sourced by a magnetic up to power type of external type of field is given by multiplication of the, the US quadrupolar log number. Times the magnetic up to power plus number times this alpha, which is the, the new quantity that arises in the Lagrange. And this is basically the same expression up to a constant as the as this other RTL band. So basically their ratio must be a constant. And so before, basically this plus number and this plus number are basically the same up to a constant factor. This is what the Lagrangian uh, formula is being saying, is telling us. And likewise for this, they always come in pairs. So this is Weird because when looking at, at it from the momentum point of view, uh, this just drops from nowhere. It's just a trivial result. And when looking at it from the perturbation theory point of view, this is nowhere to be found. It, it's just there's no nothing obvious telling us obviously telling us that these 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 one number these number are, are should be related independently of the equation mistake I might have. But is this like the most general Lagrangian up to the second order that gives you like first order equations? This so is like... the most general Lagrangian that considers interaction between the four uh, uh, multiple, uh, multiple multiple fields that we were considering and the spin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So assuming a static fluid that might be wrong. So what we did was to compute exactly the ratio between type of numbers. That's what I'm showing here. This is the ratio of the, the previous ratio of rotation type of numbers that I was showing, according in terms of the compactness of the body for different equation of state and refer to the polytropic index distributed for three different ones, and they are for just another equation of state of star that we consider. And regardless of whichever you you consider, this will always be the same result. We basically think that the ratio is always the same, although not constant. This is the constant value that was predicted by the Lagrangian formula. And we see that for low compactness, goes to that value, but for higher compactness, it deviates a bit by about 5% uh, from the predicted value. So, what we found here is that so there must be some hidden symmetry between the RTLNs, hidden in the sense that it is not obvious in the perturbation theory point of view, uh, because their ratios, their ratios are independent of the equation of state, although they are not constant. But it really is something, this is really a result that does not care about what is happening inside the body. This is a GR result. Yeah. Um, and there are two obvious things to ask here that I'm aware of that are one, why exactly this, does this happen from the perturbation theory point of view? What, what, is, what is the symmetry of the equation? What is the relation between the equation that is making this happen? And two, uh, why exactly is there a, a difference between the behavior Predicted by Lagrangian formalism and the one that I that we found in numerical results from perturbation theory, and they, those are still open questions as of now. We still are not sure exactly how this comes to be, 
I'll go for the Wacker question on how is why exactly there is a difference in the the result. We suspect that this is a matter of a, a different definition or a subtle difference of the definition of title of numbers in conservation theory and in the PN formulas that is not evident except at higher compactness. Having said this, uh, and this was made a lot of talk of computing numbers and that is seemingly unrelated to reality. Um, we would like to know, I, I would assume I'd like to know why exactly we should care about this. So what we've done is to uh, consider the following set. We consider uh, this is the, the generic uh, Formula for a gravitational waveform, PN gravitational waveform up to 6.5 PN in the in the in the tidal contribution. So basically, we we don't the the waveform is given by by its amplitude and its phase. We the amplitude is then changed in the picture. The phase is given by a point particle contribution, which goes up to 4 PN. So I don't know exactly what the state of the art right now, and the tidal contribution. Which at 5 pm enters the tidal from the static tidal from the that we computed in the first part of this talk. At 6 pm order, a new contribution of the tidal of the static tidal from the enters the electric one, and the contribution for the magnetic tidal from the And at 6.5, four new terms enter. Uh, this is again just a term that comes from the static tidal from the These two are in interaction between the spin and the tidal of and the static tidal of numbers. And this gamma hat here is a contribution that comes from the RKO lens. The four RKO lens that we computed before interrupt at the same system at the order through this term gamma hat. What we want to do is to understand whether there, whether it matters, if it matters whether we use graphic, where we model our gravitational signals with a waveform that takes into consideration that these 6.5 pn order terms. That are of inter that come from interaction between the spin and the tidal of numbers, but they are seemingly very small because again we are using we are assuming very close, very small spin for the stars as it should be in a in a in spiral phase of a binary Sorry, can you say again what is a delta lambda tilde? Delta lambda tilde. So lambda tilde is a combination of the of the electric for the forward tidal of numbers. Of, of the two bodies. Mm -hmm. So if this is based on the one, uh, one, the one, the previous one, the one plus one, the two over two, if I'm not mistaken. Delta on the field is another combination from which then you can, that, that appears naturally in the waveform, mm -hmm. from which then you can extract one, the one and one, the two from the, from each body mm -hmm. uh, independently. But this, this is just another combination of the, of the two uh, static type of numbers. I don't exactly know the, the formula because it's not the obvious. So how we do this is we basically compute, we find a metric to compare, we define a metric to compare uh, gravitational waveforms given the noise of the of the detection that we are considering that will detect the gravitational signal. And then we compute the match between that basically that is the match between the the, the two waveforms. So we basically say that our true signal H. Is the signal that is given by the full waveform that we saw before? Take that because the, the true signal, the signal that will be emitted by the by the, star, the binary star system, will take into consideration the 6.5 pn or return the spin tidal interaction. But we are trying, but we are using HT, a template which only considers the which is this previous formula without considering this two tidal distribution. We are basically saying we have a true signal that is coming towards us, and we're trying to model it. With something that does not consider spin tidal interactions, and we'll see if this is a good model or not. What we find is that so this is a, the probability that we that we obtain by trying to model uh, our true signal with the the model that is lacking the spin tidal interaction. For why would you detectors for current uh, current active uh, gravitational detectors? We find that. There is a an induced bias on our measurement of lambda field of the tidal probability, but given the accuracy of the detector, it's not very large. However, for third generation detectors, what we find is that the induced bias when, com when compared with the accuracy of the detector is large enough that 
this will basically give us, give, given the accuracy of that, this will give us a wrong measurement of on the field. So if we try, so the bottom line is, if we try to model uh, our waveforms with uh, same way that does not consider spin tidal interaction and extract from that the, the side of probability, we'll extract the wrong value. And it's important because if we extract the wrong value, we'll make we will basically make wrong assumptions on the equation of state of the neutron star. Yeah. So, in the end, we will basically take the wrong conclusions about what the equation of, of, of state of the neutron star is. Uh, we did this for two different equations of state, a uh, softer and stiffer one. Um, but this just goes to show that this result is dependent on the equation of state, and since we do not know what the equation of state will be exactly, well, we must take this into consideration if we are to. To use third generation detectors to its full to their full extent. What is the difference between the two equations of state because the rotational club number for slide four is much smaller? Than, sorry? Is that so the difference between the, the two cases, the two equations of state? So in ah, the slide four, yeah. clearly it's less important the, the rotational. Form. So it's not only less important if you have the so these curves here, the, the red one is for um, for a negative spin. Of the, of the body of the body or so opposing spin to mm -hmm. for a positive spin and you see that they they switch also between the state right. what is happening here is basically that if you remember all oh. there are two contributions here basically which are the this the interaction between the spin and the static color probability and the the rtlns themselves what is happening there we tested this is that in the in the apr for the, the upper case uh, these contributions basically point in the same direction and uh, build on each other. While for the slide four, they contradict, they they have opposite signs, and so they cancel each other out. Not cancel each other out exactly, but slightly cancel each other out. So that's why you see that these basically they all push in the same direction and, and make a larger bias on the measurement of on the field. While for this case, they contradict each other. And, So and so we established that the RTL band and speed out effects are important for the measurement of the field. And going on this of this stream, we basically try also try to understand whether gamma hat itself, so the RTL lens itself will be measurable. So this would mean that we have another more or less independent way of uh, of understanding the equation of state of the stars. What we found is that in the best case scenario, gamma hat is marginally measurable. So there, with some, with some accuracy, but not too much. The problem is that gamma hat, uh, which is written here, explicitly, uh, is, is a combination of the spins of the bodies and the RTL lens of the body. And what we find is that while yes, we can measure the gamma hat term with some accuracy, we cannot measure the the spins of the stars with enough accuracy to Extract the title of numbers uh, from here. Basically, third generation factors apparently from this fisher magnetic analysis that we did uh, will not give us uh, accurate measurements of the spin of the stars. And this is something that could probably be studied in more detail with the proper uh, Bayesian analysis, but we have not done it. So, uh, and this basically is what how I would try to convince you that. So tidal effects, even so, basically studying static tidal deformability is not enough. We need to study further tidal effects to really understand. Well, not only to really understand all tidal effects that are happening to a body while it's going on, while it's going on in a spiral, but also just to understand the, the static tidal deformability itself. Because modeling the the spiral without taking into consideration other tidal effects. Again, it uses a bias on the measurement of the static color probability that we, at least at that one, we would like to, to be able to measure that. Um, what, and now we go into the um, problems part of this talk. The problem is that we did this visualization, I said, on the static fluid of the sun, which says that the perturbation of the core velocity. The first order in spin perturbation of curve velocity is zero and only the time component is non zero. If we look at this from a physically motivated uh, point of view, uh, 
this basically does not hold. What holds is the condition of the rotational fluid, which in the static fluid uh, assume that the core body has another non zero component. Basically, um, this is basically a problem of how you approach the static fluid. If you just take the equations and put everything that is that is time dependent to zero immediately, and you do your computation, you arrive here at the static fluid. And that is a, a possible solution of your of your system. If instead you you consider the whole dynamical setup and and you compute your solutions in that dynamical setup somehow, and then you took the static limit, you'd arrive at some static solution, which is not the one given by the initial static fluid assumption, but the one given by this rotation fluid assumption. And so in the end, if we want to compute the static tidal perturbation of a body that is slowly rotating, we need to compute, we need to do it in the rotation of fluid. So we need to compute this out to find. And then we find that output phi depends on the dynamic force quantities computed in the static frame. So we do need to compute time dependent perturbation. And now we're back to this problem where we really do not know. So this is a system that is complicated enough that this problem of the mixing between the, the external perturbations and this form happened. And well, to be cynical about it, we are stuck. Um, I can just give a brief overview of the different approaches that are being tried right now to solve these problems. So the first one is just to say, okay, we have the dynamical, the full dynamical uh, system of equation of perturbation equations, and we try to solve it. And again, there are no no growing decaying modes at infinity. Everything is oscillating. There is no, there really is nothing that you can work with to separate the response and external perturbation. And so this first approach basically dies. Um, we then also tried a more uh, subtle approach, which is to also perturb our system on the frequency. So we assume small frequencies, and we have a perturbation scheme that is now first order in the tidal, in amplitude of tidal field, first order in the spin, and first order in the frequency. But because, of, because now we are perturbing both in spin and frequency, there starts being a, a, a perturbation scheme starts breaking down because we have to be very careful if one is not larger than the other. And so basically we now have a, a myriad of, of uh, situations where we have to be very careful when and where they apply. And because on top of that, we still have some mixing, some problem of mixing between response and perturbation terms, this approach failed as well. What we've been trying to do and what other groups also have been trying to do is to uh, compute tidal effects via scattering process. So this is a very interesting topic, which I have not worked much, but have, have, I have been following in the last year or so, which basically uh, the idea is that, so we cannot, in, we cannot compute uh, tidal effects in uh, full dynamical setups, but we can compute scattering, uh, scattering processes. We are very good at computing scattering uh, process, scattering amplitude. So what, what people did was to, in, in the side of GR, compute the scattering amplitudes of, uh, of some body. On this, and then through uh, effective field theory, make a connection between scattering amplitudes and the tidal responses. So basically you, you work on what should be the, the response of, a, of an extended body to the tidal, external tidal perturbation on, from the effective field theory point of view. We make a, connect, we make a, a generic connection with how the how those tidal how, how those coefficients that how those tidal coefficients connect with scattering amplitudes and then we compute the scattering amplitudes from the point uh, from the point of view of GR and make the connection to the EFT. And this has seen some progress for computing tidal of numbers of white holes, for instance. Uh, but when it comes to bodies that are more complicated in the sense that they need some non-analytical uh, some numerical uh, Techniques to be computed or to be described. In. Um, what happens is that basically the the success that has been that people have been having in, in computing tidal effects for scattering process depends on some approximations that are specific to the white hole. And so it is still very much an open question that we are working on: how exactly can we extend these, these very recent results to generic compact bodies, including in our case, more interesting to us, 
exclusion source. And so I'll conclude here by saying, I hope I convinced you that title of numbers are a window into the field and complex objects and how the, how the, what they are composed of and study the physics of things that are happening inside them. Um, we will be able to measure title of numbers in the start of the third generation factors, but to do so, we do need detailed models of the title effect. Namely, we need to understand exactly uh, rotation of, how the rotation of numbers work and what is happening with the hidden symmetry and what's happening with the rotational fluid and basically all these issues surrounding the title of numbers of fully rotated objects. And furthermore, we given that the RTLM that such are supposed to be such a small effect that have that matters for the modeling of on the measurement of the static teleformability, it is also probably likely that the dynamical effect of title of numbers will also must be modeled correctly so that we have an accurate measurement of static teleformability itself. And that's how well it I'm open for questions. Other questions? Well, maybe I can start with one. Uh, so you mentioned this difficulty of the dynamical tidal numbers, um, but what's the status in the Newtonian case? Or the, was the Newtonian case fully dynamical and everything? No, uh, the Newtonian case initially was not fully dynamical. Yes. So I, uh, I think for the Newtonian case, this is solvable because we do not have this problem. Yeah. So. Let me go right back to the start. Um, where are you? Yeah, you see here that the problem here is that for the GR case, you have to artificially, or the way we are doing things for the GR case, we have to artificially separate what is the response from what is the external part of the perturbation because it's so in the metric, but then you cannot compute the, the multiple moments of, of a metric if it has a growing part. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, so we must actually separate the two. In the Newtonian case, this is a sort of part of the potential. This is the potential of your body, which is which, hey, it's it's done for you, basically. So the problem the the problem in GR is really that you have to somehow identify what is the external part of the perturbation. While in Newtonian gravity, you don't. It's just it's your starting assumption that there is something that is external that is affecting then the internal. So in the gravity, it's solved by definition. And I don't know if there's if there have been there probably have been some works on on doing the nitty gritty details of it of getting dynamic level of numbers, but it's a problem that is solved by definition in, in Newtonian gravity that and and it's solved in a way that does not help us to fix the GR problem. Yeah, yeah. I see. More questions? How important would the dynamical actually computing the world dynamical log numbers are? Uh, is it important given that they are only important in the final the log numbers are only important in the final stage, right? Why you can yes. in numerical simulations anyway? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I so that was an argument that I probably could use for the rotation of log numbers, and it turns out that they are important. That's point number one. Solid. Point number two is that well they might have they might not have they might have a contribution that is very small and very and very very much in the weight part of the spiral, but it also can happen that they so at this point when we call when we say that we are dealing with static tides, we are not really really dealing with static tides, we're dealing with adiabatic tides. We're just assuming that the body does not have it, the internal parts of the body are not fast enough to react to the external tidal perturbations, and we can Basically, call them static. When we start going into dynamical tidal perturbations, what might happen is that some the the dynamic tidal perturbations might resonate somehow with internal processes. And yes, it might be a very short amount of time where the things uh, matter, but there might be a spike where it, it really resonates with the body, and there it makes a very big difference. There have been some some studies of tidal resonance in this, like this in the, for other systems, I think, and. That is the thing that basically we're not sure. It might this might happen. And given the experience with relational numbers where 
the contributions are small, but apparently they do matter for mm -hmm. for future detectors. Uh, no, I guess one might err inside of caution oh. and, and say that well, we should check this before. No, uh, my question was whether you can actually, I mean, well, from the numerical simulation, actually check some ah. if it matters or not, because you do have numerical simulation. Yes, I do not. I do not know exactly then on this side. Do you have the numerical simulations of? I don't know. I'm asking. Yeah, I, so yeah, I do not know. I do not know if, if from the numerical simulation of the spiral part you can really well, I mean, see you, what you have numerical simulation, of course, from the last orbit. So, um, but the normally that's where tidal effects happen. Yeah, but I do not know if from having numerical simulation of that part whether you can see I this part of the effect of the of the orbit is really the, because there was a dynamical tidal right, effect. I, I, know, I don't think I wouldn't think that that would be possible, but but also I do not know. I was interested in this part that you showed that the ratio was independent of the squishing state. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, has this been so you showing some, but uh, has this been tested for like a lot, lots of square equations of state, or like uh, we've, we've to done which this, extent we've done it is... for a couple more, and after seeing a couple of times getting always the same number, we've stopped checking those ones. Uh, so the point is that uh, yes, this is this is uh, we consider it to be a solid result. So this this really is independent of the equation of state, as long as you're assuming a perfect group. Okay. Um, and, and 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 these these are the same up to this is not a very good plot for showing this, but these, these are the same up to just numerical error. So there there really must be some relation between the. Equations that define the math, the two master equations for each sector that define the relation type of numbers that explain this uh, this uh, this ratio between type of number that is independent of the equation. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, no, I'm just throwing something. <laughs> I'm sure you you check those things, but no, for quasi almost uh, it will be something similar, right? Piece of, um, as a yeah, spectrality between elements. between the modes, yeah. right? So and you can you know that there is as a spectrality because the two sectors are related through yeah uh, double transformation. We've played with this for a couple of months, and uh, the different the difference with that situation is that in that case we are dealing with the homogeneous equations uh, for the two sectors. In this case, we are first we have matter. So right. So this already this should, yeah. this should not work. And second, we are dealing with non-homogeneous equations with the source. We are dealing with the first order with the equation for the first order one for the first order of variables, sourced by the zeros for the variables. And also this, the the ver the variables are compute are of certain mode power index L, and they are sourced by by quantities of mode power index L plus one or L minus one. I still think that we could probably Get this result with this uh, going this way that you suggested, but it's basically trying to find how exactly does this miracle happen that because we have that even while having matter because we are dealing with the first order perturbations of spin and because we are mixing the multiple modes somehow the this spectrality appears here again out of nowhere. I I think that is a possible explanation. I really I just really don't know how to get it. Now that you're talking about this case, uh, say a question of almost coming from backwards, like so there's this popular phrase of uh, love numbers, tidal love numbers being zero for black holes. Is this the case also for rotation of tidal love yes. numbers for all of them? So uh, with the even without so even without the scattering process, but especially now with the scattering process method of computing uh, tidal of numbers, tidal of numbers of even of curve have been found to be zero. Up to I think at least up to second order in spin, and I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, up to second order in the frequency because there's a frequency expansion happening there. In those there's a low frequency expansion happening there for the computation. 
And basically, yes, the curve of numbers are zero. That has been established right, uh, already. So even curve, well, even curve white holes are special. What has been found is that the when you define tidal of numbers, you define them as a conservative part of the of the tidal response, and the imaginary part is not zero. The imaginary part is also an effect that you already knew, which is tidal. Which is what's tidal heat. Tidal heat. But it is the dissipative effect that happens with the, with the white. Hole. Okay. And uh, that has been that has been found as as part of the tidal response, but is not part of the tidal of numbers. So that seems like that formalism, right? Uh, not based on the metric is an advantage, but it's only applicable in black holes, right? Not on stars. So yeah, it's, you couldn't do that something analogous here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, more questions? Well, I guess there are no more questions, so let's thank Gonzalo again. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe.